Hey, welcome back. I'm Savannah Jones with Stephen Hodges, and this is GMG's Bootstraps and Business, and we're going to be speaking with Jason Atkinson. Our primaries have just closed down. We may have a historic run for governor, possibly three women in this race. I think it's been called, so I think we're going to probably go with that. Now, Jason, I know you have a lot of experience in government. Um, you're also an author, a fisherman, uh, and, and many, 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 many other things. I think you need to stop complimenting but. <laughs> <laughs> but we want to get your perspective on, uh, you know, who's running, who, how they got there, and what does the future look like for these possibly, and I think we are going with three women, right? Yep, We're going correct. with an Peter, independent, a de Democrat. He just called Drazen, so definitely three women. For so sure. what does this look like? So first of all, tell us a little bit about you. So oh. we know, you know, that where the information's coming from. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jason Atkinson. I have been around public service for 30 years. Uh, I have been involved in races as small as um, city council all the way up to two presidentials, uh, about 50 legislative races and initiatives, and then certainly as an elected official myself. Um, I, I have a master's and MBA where I concentrated in market research and have done strategy work uh, for campaigns, both candidates and corporates and all those types of uh, uh, endeavors. I, um, I am a fisherman, um, funny you should say that. Um, I do run an, an NGO called pastorsmonday.com, which has been a lot of fun over the last few years. And um, what I'm really trying to do is I also grew up in radio and broadcasting, so I'm still I'm on the board of the Oregon um, television um, and film board. I'm also on a board of uh, a regional um, broadcasting entity that's radio and TV, but I grew up on radio. And what I'm really trying to do with this is as much as I'm happy to chat about Oregon politics, is I'm really trying to get a morning show with Stephen Hodges <laughs> yeah, there it back is. on the radio. There it is. Because, well, yeah. because well, all this political I've, I've stuff is for radio. So, but, uh, you know, I would, go there. I'm just trying to get back into radio. <laughs> right. uh, but on the morning, I don't want to be in the afternoon because I got too much to do. Morning, I think it'd be hilarious. I don't know who'd be the straight guy, though. Would it be me or you? I don't I don't know. It would definitely wouldn't. Point. I don't know either. Well, today we might find out. Yeah. We might. I don't, I we'll don't test know, the waters. I don't know if radio is desperate enough for us yet, but maybe. <laughs> we can you know. we be desperate. We could actually be good, I think. I think. Mean, uh, so but anyway. You were in the House of Representatives, yes. Senator, and you took a run at governor. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you do have a lot of background and knowledge in regards to politics here sure. in Oregon. Sure. And we're in a weird state right now, and, and that's not the uh, <laughs> probably not the correct Not term. weird in terms of uh, it's just it's a weird state of affairs. Correct. Maybe the, right. Uh, I think you better just to both just stop. Stop, <laughs> right. <laughs> we're not, yeah. So, so how do you see our circumstances here in the state right now and what does Oregon, everything look like? Um, we are an unusual state. We have mm, less than 4 million people. We have a giant footprint. Uh, we're a big state with very few people in it. We have two time zones in the state. We have 36 counties. Um, our DNA is unusual. Um, we are at the end of the Oregon Trail. And so people who came here historically uh, we're very independent by nature. And if you look at all of our history, uh, going back to 1859 when we became a state, our people are very independent and um, really want to be left alone. And so the things that have made Oregon famous over the years, the times in which we as a state have led the country, have been on things like direct election of United States senators. We were part of the the... I don't want to say the modern day, how the word progressive is used, but in the historic progressive movement 120 years ago, we were part of that movement. We, we still take pride in the bottle bill. We still take pride in having all of the beaches open. But after that, uh, we have largely not been the leaders. Uh, we have been a state where the last 20 years we've had a huge flip in um, people moving in here. We used to have a, 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 a city called Portland that people was, it was one of the, the fastest growing um, cities in the nation. It was us, Portland, uh, Austin, Texas, and Brooklyn. Those were like the three hot growing urban areas and that we've, we've since lost that. But when that came in, uh, we didn't get that same 
uh, mindset of people being independent or pioneer or multi-generation. And it's not that it's not that those folks weren't welcome here, but they just brought a different thing. So uh, we had for years uh, these bumper stickers that said, keep Oregon, keep Portland weird. And then we woke up a couple of years ago and it seemed like those people won. There was no more balance. <laughs> right. um, it seemed like it got really weird. Yeah, uh, it, there was no more balance. And so we have a, an extremely divided state. And the state of Oregon is really five states because of geography. So we're so big. We have five different states in, in our boundary. There's Portland, which is its own world. There's the Willamette Valley, which is different than Portland. There's the Oregon coast. Um, really, there's six. There's Central Oregon, which is now the little Portland um, in the high desert. You have Eastern Oregon, which, as you know, has been voting in the last few days on trying to be part of of. Uh, of Idaho. And then you have Southern Oregon that really isn't connected to the rest of the state at all. And so we're a very divided group of people, uh, some of which are independent and some of which are happy to keep it weird. Mm-hmm. So, it, it, I mean, you, you and I have, You got to admit, right. that was a great first answer. It, I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> I, I, I mean, even I'm, I was kind of quiet. I'm like, <laughs> what's happening? I mean, um, you know, full transparency, I've known you for quite some time. We were good friends for sure. And so I was a little shocked by that answer. I'm not going to lie. I, I didn't expect it. Uh, but, I mean, you know, I mean, think about it, you just said it. Uh, you know, they're voting or looking to vote to basically go go to idaho any you know i've talked about that privately any chance that you think that could happen no i i don't think there is but um i also don't want to temper down that um that independent spirit that we have um they the group that is involved with that ran up uh did some research and then started to let the the findings out that that in fact um uh, residents in Eastern Oregon co- or, or in, in rural Oregon are costing urban Oregon residents 300 bucks per head. And so why not just let us take our money and not be part of Portland? That's really the, that's, the that's, feeling. that's really the feeling and let us do our own thing. Um, I, I, you know, these efforts have come up before and I live, most of the time in a place that's that's right in the heart of the state of Jefferson, which was tried um, to become its own state from Northern California and Southern Oregon several, um, well, for the last, since the 1930s. And I, I, it's, it's interesting because it's part of a larger problem. When people hate government, they really aren't very good at creating their own government. Right. And so um, I used to tell Republicans, don't run against the institution that you're trying to get yourself elected to. Good, which, wise words. Which is, <laughs> which is something that if you look at most of the Republicans running for office, they're running to tear down the very office that they're, that they're running for. So if you look at some of these state movements, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I, don't have a, I don't really have a, a dog in that fight. But I don't see people who fundamentally don't want government creating a government for themselves very well. You know, and sometimes for me, it, I, I think it feels, I mean, I, I feel for those people because I think you could make the argument, uh, their argument is they're being ignored, mm-hmm. right? That whatever happens in Salem is whatever Portland wants or Eugene. Mm-hmm. And that is, I hear that on a, you know, see it on social media, hear it. I, I feel for them because they are not Portland. They're different. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm, and, I'm part of them. Right. And it's, and it's completely true that the biggest divide that we have, I think this is probably more philosophical than you want to get to on a state wrap up, but the biggest divide um, on a lot of these movements is people don't feel respected anymore. They're certainly not respected by their government. They're certainly not respected. If you have a, a cultural Portland running the state of Oregon, uh, when when people outside of, uh, of of Portland have a completely different view of the world, and so you know I work a lot and, and have a lot of friends in the Native American community, and there's a lot of issues and there's a lot of bad blood and there's a lot of very bad history. But the bottom line of all of it is respect. They don't feel respected, and therefore they're not going to trust. And so I think respect is really the big that big driver that 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 divides people. Wow. Um, so 
what would you say? I mean, this is going to be an interesting year, this election come November. Mm-hmm. Here we have, you have, uh, we have Tina Kotek, Democrat, who's been in, and we interviewed her on this show, um, who's been in politics for quite some time. Uh, somebody once told me, definitely a career politician. I don't say that in a bad way, but, you know, has been there mm-hmm. um, leading the Democrat charge. Some people are saying she's really far left. Um, and then you have a, uh, Christine Drazen, I've never spoken to, but um, who is running for the Republican Party, who doesn't really feel like she's far right at all. In fact, I would, I mean, just from watching everything, I've, I've seen um, more right you know, more moderate than anything. And then we have an independent, Betsy Johnson. What is your take on this setup? Because uh, in my life, we've never had this type of election where you where you have a strong independent running that is well-funded. Yeah, actually, the funding issue is the, is the, is the real uh, weakness in the Republican world. But let me let me let me answer your question first by telling you something that I don't think anybody else would tell you for your listeners. Yeah, and that is this: of uh, of all of the candidates running, and there was a lot of candidates running for governor this year. Um, Tina, Betsy, and Christine probably are the most uh, well equipped to stand in on day one and be governor of any people we've ever had running for governor. There so you were the three first person to, to say actually that. say that. Yeah. And I, I actually wanted you to say something like that. So <laughs> I, I set you up. I'm sorry, guy. I knew well, I'd get you. I, I, and the I, reason I wanted that was because I think a lot of people, including our listeners, right? We have a lot of business owners mm-hmm. that listen. Um, for them, I mean, I, I think that to be fair, you know, that's why we had Tina Kotek on. Right. I had I'd known what I had heard about her. I you know, Betsy, I think, is coming on as well. And probably, I, hopefully, we'll get uh, Christine Drazen on. Um, but I thought we asked Tina some tough questions mm-hmm. that were going around social media. And I wanted her to be able to to talk to it, right? Sure. Be able to, to say, I'm, you know, I'm not Kate Brown. That's, you know, or, or what have you. I don't think people have a full holistic view of her. And that's, that's why I was glad to hear. Well, I'll, I'll tell that. you, I, I, um, they both, all, all three of these, uh, all three of them are friends of mine. I'll, I'll also say that. And, um, and on election night, I texted all three of them. I mean, I mean, I really, I, I've got a lot of time with, uh, with, with, with all three anyway. Um, they're both, or excuse me, all three of them are very well skilled in how you do policy and how you manage policy with all of the frail and large egos that are inside the Capitol, which is, a, which is leadership. You know, leadership, uh, my favorite definition of leadership is offending people at a rate that they can absorb. And there's a lot of people who just like to throw bombs and rip down. Well, no one; those aren't leaders. Those are bomb throwers. No one's going to follow them. But all three of these uh, women have proven themselves to be very good leaders, to bring their caucuses, hold them together, and to move them through some very difficult waters. Now, Tina has been uh, a House member and a Speaker of the House. Now, I don't know if it's like this in other states, but the Oregon House of Representatives and the Oregon Senate, the Oregon Senate is like, is like junior college. And the house is like junior high. Oh it's boy. like a food fight all <laughs> the time. It's, it's oh boy. <laughs> managing, managing the house of representatives. If, if you're, if you're the speaker is excruciatingly difficult to do. You've got people on your left and people on your right and you're not enough, but you're the boss and you've got to move an agenda and negotiate a budget and negotiate with the Senate and make sure that the governor will sign it all. I mean, it's really difficult position. Drazen has got perhaps some of the most fascinating background is she actually started as a staffer and she was, she worked in the committee staff and, and if you're a committee staff person, you actually really learn even better than a legislator, how, um, how, uh, uh, committee, not committees, but how agencies work. I mean, she really knows. And then she became uh, a staffer and then she became, um, chief of staff to the Speaker of the House, who was from Northeastern Oregon. 
Uh, Drazen's interesting for f- people to know that she actually is from rural Oregon. She's uh, r- her family's from uh, Klamath Falls and from uh, Eagle Point, Oregon. And the Speaker of the House that she worked for is a speaker from Elgin, Oregon, in northeastern Oregon. Yet she lives uh, in Canby and understands. I mean, she probably of everyone has got her her fingers and toes in in all of those five different organs that I explained to you a minute ago. But she was elected, and she was elected. uh, I was trying to be helpful in her first primary. In fact, I might have been a little bit more than involved. But it was a four-way primary. The lobbyists had all picked somebody else. The the far-right-wing folks had picked somebody else. Somebody else was a Johnny-come-lately, and then Drazen. And she won. And I told her, I, I said, you know, you are probably the only person that's instantly uh, ready for the for the statewide stage, and you certainly you're ready to be in leadership. And 18 months later, she's the leader, the equivalent of Tina's uh, sparring partner. She's running all. She's leading all the Republicans in the House now. If you think it's hard to run a caucus of Democrats in the House, try the Republicans. So you have two late, two of these women who have both managed incredibly difficult caucuses and negotiated. So Drazen, uh, even though she's, um, for some people new, she's actually got 20 years of budget negotiations behind her belt. And then there's Betsy, and Betsy, of course, is just one of my favorite people. She is, she is, um, I used to steal her glasses. She wears these big glasses, and I used to walk up on the Senate floor and steal them and walk away and just wear them for a few oh, speeches. But she's, uh, she's, she's absolutely... Um, what you see is what you get. The what you saw on television with the helicopters and and uh, not on my watch. That's who she really is. And she's um, she found herself so many times as representing north uh, northeastern Oregon, Astoria, which is it's not a conservative place and it's not a liberal place. It's like an old school Oregon independent. Um, a lot of uh, conservative, blue-collar Democrat fishing families. And she just, as a good senator, she wouldn't roll over uh, her constituents for Portland. And it found her to be, in, in several sessions, in probably the most important part of legislature, which was the, the, the deal maker. Everybody needed her vote, and she played that perfectly. And so she's... Um, you know, but Ed, she did that as a Democrat too. So her independence is is new. Well, it was, it was, anyway, oh. I always have a theory a, about you know if, if somebody's going to win something, and her glasses. I mean, it's like the <laughs> the Harry Carey meets you know strong female independent. I, I you know so my it's not about you know policy. It's about the, the oh, it's branding. Yeah, yes. it's yes. Got branding. Yes. I mean, you're going to win she's because you got, got the best branding. Yeah, right. I mean, right. you got these so big. You know, I have to. I have to tell you, I keep. I keep saying I talked to Tina in first person. I talked to uh, Betsy in first person. But f- since forever in my phone, when it rings and it's it's Drazen, it doesn't say Christine Drazen. It's always been Drazen Drazen. I don't know. I've just always called her by her last name. Even you know, with her husband and the wonderful and his name's Dan. Her name's Drazen. So anyway, right? Yeah, well, yeah. So her her catchphrase it is, is it's a very Drazen. catchy last name. I mean, then Tina's got her <laughs> stick too. I mean, no, so I it's going to be an interesting. I, this, this is yeah. going to be a fascinating. Um, this is fascinating. So the the things that are the variables that are on the table now that haven't been there before is um, uh, Tina has got uh, or Oregon has very weak parties. So the Republican party and the Democrat party, the the party, the party's sole job is to get people elected and neither party has been proven to be very good at it. They're not very good at uh, helping their candidates. They're not very good at um, uh, voter registration. Uh, They're very good at getting on the news and picking fights or picking sides on policy, but policy is really not what a, 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 a party's job is. It's to get people elected. So, in steps on the left, the unions, which have a machine in Oregon, a very powerful machine. And so Tina has that machine behind her. Drazen does not have a strong or a machine at all behind her. Betsy um, has mostly Republican donors' money. 
behind her. So she has raised a tremendous amount of money from folks who traditionally support Republicans. So if the election were held today, uh, we the numbers show that Betsy pulls from Tina. Betsy doesn't pull from uh, Drazen. But what Drazen needs is Drazen needs some of those unaffiliated voters. So your listeners need to understand when we say unaffiliated voters, you assume they're all a bunch of moderates. There are people that all moved to the left because of, you know, they didn't they didn't want to do the Tea Party or Trump, so they left. Uh, but in Oregon, our non-affiliated voters include the far left, people that would associate as far left or Green Party or far left, and people that left the Republican Party for Trump. So the biggest uh, loss of party uh registrants in the last five years in Oregon has been uh, Republicans that have almost all that we've done all the losing and all our vo- voters have moved to As he is right now are the Chicago Cubs of Oregon politics. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> and I'm a Cub fan. So I can get away with saying that we finally got our title. Yep, one. So, you, so. You, you have, you have Betsy's got, Betsy doesn't necessarily, Betsy certainly has a leg up right now, especially with all the, traditional like timber money is behind Betsy instead of behind a Republican. Drazen is about to get pulled into the web of, of uh, the Republican Governors Association under the leadership of Doug Ducey, which is for the first time a very powerful organization. Tina will have the unions. But then you've got something else thrown in the mix, and that is uh, we've got Roe v. Wade. Uh, Roe v. Wade was not in the mix, really, in the primary. It's certainly not in a way that would affect too many things. Um, and we've got a potential war with Russia. And then we have another thing that's really fascinating that, that none of these candidates talked about, um, but that is gas prices. You can argue, uh, and I think Drazen will argue, that uh, the Kotech and Johnson were part of what could have been a very large increase in gas prices while she was not. Both of uh, Johnson and Kotech will argue that a pro-life position is not uh, apt to be governor. So those, those, those hydraulics, and then you put on top of that a potential war with Russia, yeah, it's going to be a... It's going to be a very fascinating race. You know, the, the, what, what fascinates me is how Betsy Johnson was Democrat, goes independent. Everybody I talk to that knows of Betsy Johnson or likes, likes Betsy Johnson is a Democrat. But to your point, a lot of Republican donors coming in. And so I always... That dynamic is mind-blowing to me. It's you're know, like, wow, a lot of Republican donations... But everybody I talk to that really likes her is a moderate, either D or maybe some. Mo- I don't know any moderate R's even that well, are, see, the, are, the you Republican know, world is the Republican. And that's anecdotal. Is 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 split in three ways. There's been the, there's the grassroots Republican, mm-hmm. which is is largely to the right. There is the insider slash lobby world, uh, lobbyists. And, and insiders, which which are predominantly between Salem and Portland, of course. And then you have um, the, the the third makeup of that would be you know the your, your traditional grassroots, your people that are Republican and and want to get out and and uh, support Republican candidates. Those three groups never have ever gotten along in Oregon. Right, they don't get along at all. And so, in the case of this race, you've got in the Drazen's primary, there was a whole bunch of people going after that one third of of the far right part. Um, the traditional insider was with Betsy, uh, and lobbyists have lined up behind Betsy, and then you had the fight over over the rest of the traditional uh, Republicans, which I think her vote tally was like sixty thousand. So it's it's she's got uh, she has she has the most work to do to put a coalition together that could win. But um, with Betsy in the race, there's a real opportunity for Drazen to win the race. Mm. Wow. Splitting the votes. Mm. It's happened yeah. before. I mean, well, it feels like we finally, I mean, there's another way to look at it, right? We finally are getting more than just two choices. 
right? I mean, I, I hear well, all if, the time. If you go back to the 90s, there was the, the Frontmeyer Mobley Barbara Roberts race. It was this exact same dynamic, it, but it, effectively then it was two Republicans that split and put Barbara Roberts in, in office. Here you have the exact opposite. You have two Democrats, uh, Betsy and Kotek, uh, splitting p- potential for, for Christine Drazen. So it's we've been here before, but well, yeah, it's, I it's mean, the dynamic is very different. Not to age you, um, but in the nineties, he wasn't I, I, I mean, come on, man! <laughs> like, I, do you know what I was doing? I, I, I don't know anything about did, politics did in the nineties. Did I not start off in eighteen fifty nine? I mean, come on. man, I, yeah, good memory. It I was, mean, <laughs> I kind of vaguely remember the name from my art just because maybe it showed up on a. A, you know, paper that I happened to glance at between, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I mean, yeah, Dave was uh, Dave should have been pro- everybody. Uh, Dave, Dave should have been Dave should have been governor. Then. And there was a little bit of that because you had that in, in the nineties: Bill Clinton, George W. Mm-hmm. Ross Perot, mm-hmm. right? If not for Ross Perot, uh, you know, George George H. Bush, I should say, uh, he ends up being president again, not Bill Clinton. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's but a I, real opportunity for Drazen. Right, I, I like third parties because it, it gives, you know, it, why do especially now we have to pick sides, it feels like. You know, you talk about the bomb throwers. The people have become bomb throwers. I mean, I've noticed that, like, like you know, when I hear politicians speak, the, you know, if it's somebody on the left, they're like, oh, Republicans. They don't say the candidate they're running against. They're saying all, you know, that's yeah. what I hear as a voter, sure. all Republicans. And then when I hear a Republican speak, they're like, oh, all all Democrats. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, that's, it's not, you know, it's just, it's just, that's how you take right. it. Look, and so now we're, you the know. The people you're watching mostly on television are not Savannah. They don't know how to <laughs> right. talk yes, on, that's true. on a podcast. They don't For everybody know how to listening, Savannah holds us together. I, if, yes. They didn't know how to <laughs> actually <laughs> commentate. No, well. Look, everybody plays to their base, and right. um, I, I personally, you know, and, and, and everybody complains about social media, and, and if you're, you know, if you're on the right, you're watching Fox News, and everything else is evil, and if you're on the left, you're watching MSNBC, and you just don't understand why they can't get ratings, and CNN, and nobody's watching the network news, blah 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 blah. Echo and chamber, we, echo we have chamber. all that stuff, yeah, yeah. But there's a shelf life to it. And and once again, I'll go I'll go back to history. We've been here before. We've right. we've been here. We were here uh, before World War II. We were here in the late 1960s. We have been here before. We are, certainly we were here between Adams and Jefferson, the the, the second and third do you presidential. Do you remember that? I do. <laughs> I was there. But the point is, the point is, is that kind of polarization it does have a shelf life. The problem we have in Oregon is that that polarization has destroyed Portland, and nobody can say that that's you know. I mean, I don't say that, I'm not blaming anybody, sorta. But one of the great cities in America has been destroyed. Well, let's talk about that. You mentioned, you know, some bigger issues with mm-hmm. the gas prices and sure. war and all of those. But let's dial it in to Oregon and Portland specifically. Sure. That, you know, these three candidates running. Mm-hmm. We have issues. We have crime, homelessness. We were having trouble bringing in outside businesses yeah. and, and keeping businesses in Oregon, in Portland. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, Stephen lives in Beaverton part of P- Portland, part of the Pearl and, and Slab Town, and they just moved to Beaverton. <laughs> they just right. moved all their businesses out, right. out of downtown. So day one, we've got what what would the ideal candidate, whoever it is, whoever the winner is, what would their focus be? And right out of the gate, I mean, how, to get to your point, right. Portland back into that gem of the Portland Northwest state. Well, uh, Portland's the economic engine for the whole state, and the rest of the state isn't connected to a broken engine right now. And, and why should they be? So uh, you look at Medford, Oregon, um, it's doing more business with Los Angeles than it is with Portland, Oregon. The direct flights to L.A., there's not as many direct flights to Portland, and we're in the same state. Um, Portland, uh, crime, homelessness, drugs, all of it. I, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I said, you know, the problem with the left is they don't know when they've won. Uh, they'll, uh, here's victory. Now let's take victory 10 more steps and still it's so disrespectful to the other side that we'll poke them in the eye. And that's kind of what we've got going on in Portland. I mean, it's, it's, I think, I think a lot of all parties, all people 
humans in the state of Oregon and certainly business owners in Portland would agree. Like we may have, we crossed the line. We need to dial this back. Yeah. It's, and, and if you look at, if you, even if you go back to any sociology class and you look at how cities grow, cities fall apart on the inside, the suburbs grow, the s- suburbs fall apart, the suburbs get wider. And eventually somebody comes back to the inner city what would be called the inner city and gentrifies it back up. And then people complain that it's gentrified. Oregon has kind of been through that routine once. And now we're kind of on the second cycle. We're starting to Portland is pretty much collapsed. There's no more tourism. Uh, the tourism convention between COVID and our bad reputation has dried up. Um, some of the pillar industries, uh, legal insurance and obviously retail have moved out. And, um, you know, property values are s- continue to stay up, but I don't, you know, there's a shelf life to that too. They've run, uh, the, the city, the city has decided to run off some of the key development, um, because of process. So I say government process, Oregon's kind of funny. Um, we have centralized land use planning, communist China got rid of it. Oregon kept it. I mean, this is one of the quirks of our state. Right, doesn't but, seem to work. But if you look at, to answer your question on day one, um, I don't know if Tina will have the ability to rock the boat that a lot of people would want rocked in Portland because, fa- frankly, that's her base and that's where a lot of her support to get elected to governor is going to come from is from the very people that have broken the, broken the model. Uh, Betsy uh, has, if she were governor, complete freedom to come in, fire everybody, and start over. And Drazen uh, has the same freedom to fire everybody. What the difference with between Drazen and Johnson is, uh, I think Drazen will actually clean house at the um, at the agency level, where Johnson probably doesn't have that same ability. Johnson's going to have to rely on some Democrat uh, insiders, you know, long time uh, people that have been running the state to keep running the state, whereas Drazen will have complete freedom. So day one, you know, there's a lot of things that can be done, but it's going to Portland's its own island. It's going to take a, a long time to build up. Well, not, and not just the governor. I mean, you have a mayor and city council. You know, yeah, and then they're there. They I really mean, don't want help either, right? So. It, it, well, now. Uh, Mayor Wheeler, I believe I was reading that he actually said he asked for help from Kate Brown when uh, they had riots going and so on and so forth, and he did not receive it. That was not well documented enough, I think, in the news. Uh, but I, I, I think that is probably a couple of years you know, ago. I was sitting with the mayor in his office, mm-hmm. and uh, we had both served together, so we you know, just catching up and. And uh, before we had this big, powerful meeting we we're supposed to go to, but we were just laughing and messing around. And I'm looking at all the stuff in his office. And I could barely talk to him because there was these people protesting right outside his window, beating on drums, on, on plastic, on five-gallon buckets. And I said, I said. Wait, real quick. I said, why don't you do something? Was it a good beat? Like, no. I mean, because no. I know you and your personality, you didn't dance a little, you didn't do a little. There was nothing to make, shake. Make lemonade out of no, lemons? This was nothing. like, this wasn't like some cool Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings groove. This was like some whacked out. Dap Kings. Yeah, this was just awful. And they're just down there screaming and beating on five gallon drums. Right. I said, I said, hey man, what, you can't, I can't even talk to you. What's going on? He says, yeah, I can't get rid of them. I, so I, I go out to his window. I put up the blinds. I looked down there. I said, aren't they on city property? It's like, yeah, but it's just, it's a bigger pain to sweep them off and go through all the bad press than it is. Let's just talk louder. That's not exactly what he said, but that's what we had to do. And I was just shocked. I'm like, at a, some point in a, in a civil society, you have to draw the line that you can't do, we, we can't be everything to everybody without justice. You can't just wake up one day and say, it's, I'm going to restrict what color you're going to paint your house. But if you want to board up uh, Pioneer, Ville- Pioneer Square downtown and put a George Floyd's picture on it with spray paint, that's fine. You, you, you got to, you know, the other thing, and I, I don't want to be rude, but in Portland, you are going to pay a fine if you walk your hybrid dog and don't pick up after it. But if you're a homeless person, it's totally fine. 
at some point, there's no more line that we're drawing on what is acceptable in the state of Portland. It it's becomes all, lawlessness. It's all lawless, and it's all, like well, I said, keep Oregon, Portland weird. They the won. La- <laughs> last three times I was driving downtown proper, people are just driving like, the wrong way. They know it. They know they're, you know, but nobody's doing anything. They're running red lights. Red light is like, yeah, you know, if you can stop, stop. If not, just keep going. I mean, it is literally nobody cares. About I look. Law. I am. I am six four, and and even though in podcasts you can't see it, uh, but you both can. I mean, I'm a specimen. I mean, look at these oh huge muscles. <laughs> I mean, I'm a this? fit. I'm fit. You're right. I yeah. see it. You know. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm in Portland, I'm and in fit. one day, in one day, I got accosted three times in Portland, and. I don't think I'm the kind of guy that you would just like normally walk up and pick a fight on. Uh, but I got uh, one was a little hipster. That was a whole different right. one. And two of them were, were just completely out of their mind on drugs, uh, homeless people. One of them rifling through my trash in northwest Portland. And I said, hey, stop it. He says, go ahead and call the cops. They're not coming. Uh, that was his response. Mm-hmm. Because he knows. Because he true. knows. So anyway, we don't need to go there for, for too long. But I, I think there's there's a lot of work to do if you're governor. Well, I do think, to your point and to your point, the citizens of Oregon want somebody to say, stop. Yeah. Stop it now and let's rein this in and get to the other side of it. Because right, right now, like you said, a red light is not a red light. It's a meh. Maybe. Right. It's a maybe. Right. Hope, yeah. I mean. I like yeah. meh. Meh. I think that's that, that's going to be Should the word of the day. Yeah. <laughs> it's all kind of me right now. The whole thing. <laughs> that's the word of the day. I'm going to get home. My, my wife's going to you know, hey, do you want whatever? I'm going, meh. <laughs> I'm going to get the look. She's like, really? I think there was, uh, this last election, um, there was a couple other races that were really interesting. I think um, people, are, you know, on the right have always talked about purity tests and and if you're not 100%, uh, we won't be with you. And the, the truth of the matter is you can be 100% with some group, and they're still going to be against you if they don't like the color of your shirt or whatever. But on the left, we saw in the Schrader race, a uh, longtime um, state representative, state senator, and uh, congressman uh, might be being taken out by, by not being a pure enough Democrat. And um, that's that's so. What does that mean? Pure enough Democrat? Because I mean, you know, a lot of people. I have friends who've been asking me about Schrader, and Mm -hmm. you know, how what is all that about? So, why do you think he's struggling? Is is he not left enough? He's not. He's perceived as not by the left as not left enough. And that seat was also drawn up by the Democrats. That's the brand new uh, congressional district that has been the new Portland uh, cut out of, of Congressional District 2 and put over in the Valley. And it was, it's a complete hybrid, partisan, terrible thing to put people that have no interests in community-wise together into one district. And so he, he inherited a whole bunch of new voters that don't know him and that are further left than, than his voting record. And uh, McLeod Skinner, who uh, be- looks like is going to beat him, uh, was able to capitalize on that. And they're still counting in Clackamas, which that's going over well. Yeah, Clackamas, right. um, Clackamas is doing it, you know, kind of the Arizona model right now. By hand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. By hand. Yeah. By hand. Um, so who... <laughs> so I saw, <laughs> I saw a press release on that from uh, uh, our Secretary of State, I believe. Mm-hmm. I'm why am I forgetting her name? Shumia Fagan, is that right? Correct, yeah. I nailed it. Um, <laughs> it's been a long day. Uh, but, sh- you know, basically didn't really take ownership of it and blame Clackamas, which, you know, I, I w- you know, on a press release, I thought was a little bit much. I mean, you know, but, okay, so what? what's your take on that? I mean... It happens all, look, a couple, right, all the time, right? Ten years ago, it was Jackson County that right. was the last county in America to to count a presidential. Uh, I I don't I, I look I don't know what happened in Clackamas County as a as a person who's been a candidate before. It makes all this way more painful. Um, but you're like I think I'm losing. Yeah, um, <laughs> but there's but a there's, chance. There's a right. lot of there's a lot of votes hanging out there. Uh, yeah. A friend of mine was on the phone. 
uh, in Marion County, and they just found, and I, I don't want to say it that way, uh, about 2,000 more ballots were in the mail today that were postmarked on Election Day, which means they're to be counted. I don't want to say they were found because that sounds nefarious, but um, that happens across the state. You know, it's just when you do a mail-in ballot, it, it takes a little bit longer. But to have a whole county, especially as one of the as populous as Clackamas, uh, kind of brick it, um, the straighter race is in balance. Uh, I don't think Dra- Drazen's probably uh, uh, fine. It, the AP has called it for her, but there's a there's a handful of other races that are waiting on Clackamas County. Right. All right, so all right, so let me get into let's this. Get on. All right, here we go. see. see this is the problem. <laughs> That's where I get made fun of, and this is where it all goes goes down. No, I've Stan. actually given you the gold so far. So you, no, you've no, been actually really no, nice. No, but no, I'm waiting. So I, I think everybody needs to hear. So what what is it going to take for Tina? What is it going to take for Christine? And what is it going to take for Betsy to win? How do they? How do how do each of those candidates win? Ooh. Drazen wins by identifying suburban, educated female voters now, and making sure that those voters are in no way um, turned off by her for being pro life. That's enough for her to win. What about her finding baby formula? Can we throw that in there? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Betsy wins um, because she is going to have the most money. Uh, like I said, most of it is Republican, traditionally Republican donors and timber dollars. But um, the people running her campaign. Um, are very good at blowing a whole bunch of money and not getting a lot of results. So she's she's strong in finance. She's strong in where she's standing. Uh, and she's actually a really good candidate. Um, she wins by having Drazen weaker. She would have, she would be, I believe, probably elected uh, governor last Tuesday if uh, Republicans would have put up perhaps uh, a, a Trump, a Trump Republican, because that just is not going to that's just not going to work uh, to non-affiliated voters. So uh, she she has got to pull enough from Kotech and she's got to pull Betsy and she's got to she's got to pull enough from Republicans that want to win uh she, she has to prove to Republicans that it would be better to have her than another Democrat, i.e. Drazen can't win. That's going to be hard for her, but that's, she'll have the, the money to do it. Tina wins um, if Tina can uh, consolidate the divided uh, and apathetic voter that's a, that's a traditional Democrat, but she's got to reach out. So her campaign was mainly focused in, in Washington, Multnomah, and Clackamas County with a little bit of Lane County, but she's got to actually, all three of these uh, women now have to be governor of all 36 counties. They can't just rely on, uh, for in Tina's case, the union get out the vote. If, if, if you wake up on November, the Wednesday of November, and you're governor, you're governor for everybody, for 36 counties, which means we've got to have these, 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 all three of these ladies have to get to, uh, Curry County. They all have to spend time in Deschutes County. They all have to understand what's going on in Wasco County. They all have to kind of understand why uh, Ontario, uh, Malheur County, feels more like Boise than it does Portland. They've got to. They've got, all got to do some work. But but in, in Tina's case, she's got to appeal a lot broader than than the union machine if she's going to become governor. And let me just say, I mean. I, all three, the, the, the thing that's going to make this as a, as a viewer or a listener interesting is all three of these candidates can do what I just said. Drazen is painfully smart and a very what you, skilled person. What do you mean painfully smart? How, do you, how are you painfully? I mean, I went, to, I went to graduate school with a, with a friend of mine who, who could do financial modeling in his head. 
And it just hurt because it's so much pain for me to figure though. I mean, I could figure it out, but this guy's like 11. <laughs> <laughs> what? It's 11. It's, it's 11. <laughs> you know, it's take me half an hour. Yeah, right. It's 11. She's that kind of, uh, Drazen has got those kind of instincts. And so does Betsy, and so does Tina. All three of these, Oregon, look, we you, you may disagree with, say, Tina's politics, sure. or you may Absolutely. disagree with with uh, some of the things that Betsy has done in, in the past. I, Oregon is well served by how talented all three of these women are. They're, they're, they're all very skilled. They're all leaders. They've all led. They've all stood in very, very hard and lonely positions. A bunch of the people that have run for governor don't even know where the bathrooms are in the Capitol, let alone have ever taken a hard stand by themselves. All three of these women have. And Oregon is going to be, it's, it's, it's going to be well served. It's, I think with Tina, there's not going to be a lot of change in the state of Oregon. I think with Betsy, uh, there's going to be some change and a lot of, uh, you know, increase in TV ratings. And with Drazen, I think there'll be wholesale change. And you have to decide if that's the wholesale change you want. I think, I, I guess the question I have, you know, just doing this long enough, how does Tina get to the, that moderate Democrat that is very upset with Kate Brown, who that's not Tina, but they're making that connection by policy or by, by Democrats words. are much better at coming into line than Republicans. No, no, I, I just, agree with that. They, they just are. How, so how does she do that? Just, just, just by the force of personality. Uh, Tina is very smart. Tina is very personable. Tina is very, uh, a very skilled uh, conversationalist. She's, she's, she's very bright and she's, she's, she's fun to be around, you know, right. and, and I, I, I can't think of very many things that I agree with her on. Um, but, <laughs> but you know, she's really fun. And so is she Betsy was, she was, and so is Drazen. All yeah. three of them have the ability to reach across to people that did not vote for them and to pull new voters in. Uh, mm -hmm. Drazen of the three, Drazen's probably the one that, um, you know, the lobbyists and the, and the traditional insiders, I would say, are going to overlook. And I think that's probably one of the greatest strengths that she has in this race. They know Tina. They know Betsy. Uh, they don't necessarily have the same background with Drazen, who I've known for over t 20 years. Uh, but, but, but she, I'm telling you, she's, she's, you know, all three of them, but, and, and Drazen's very, uh, they're easy to underestimate and that's a mistake. Interesting. So changing gears just a touch. What do you, tell me a little bit about, and everybody, what you're doing to these poor pastors on, on the river. <laughs> what is, what is happening? Well, I'm not doing any of these poor pastors. I'm the, I'm the, um, I'm the, anyway. So I tried to return to public service and I found out that the public didn't want my service, um, after 30 years. Um, and, um, at the time in the, the I've always kept all of my worlds very separate from each other. Um, and I don't know why that is. I probably I probably need counseling to figure out why that is. But I had a I had a political life that never talked to a business life. I had a business life that never talked to the life I did in writing. And the writing life never talked to the life I did in film. And the film part never had anything to do with what I was doing in the Middle East. Uh, there are all these little time capsules. And one of those time one of those little uh, segments has been fly fishing, which has been a lifestyle, not a interest, but a lifestyle of mine for for years. Mm -hmm. When I ran for office and lost, um, the only thing I could go back to because I lost everything else was what I've always done since I was 13 years old, which is grab a dog and go fish. And I had this crazy pastor who, not my pastor, but a friend. He was I didn't just, really he know He was just him. crazy? No, I didn't really <laughs> know him. Poor guy. I, I didn't really know him. I should be more respectful. And he wanted me to teach him how to do this particular type of casting that I do called spay. I didn't want to teach him because I didn't want to be around any more human beings. I'd just been burned by as many, all the human beings that I knew. Well, uh, he wore me down. His day off was Monday. And it turned into this joke, yeah, I got to fish the pasture on Monday. Well, I ended up really liking him. He was really fun and really smart. 
And I figured out what kind of learner he is, and I'm, I teach. And so once you figure out what kind of learner somebody is, you can really teach to them. And he just excelled. And he was, he was so excited. How about next Monday? I got, all right, I'll keep the joke going. <laughs> How about next Monday? And so after a while, I figured I started to think about what is it when I was in public service, uh, what you learn is you know everybody, but you don't have any friends. Uh, the only time your phone rings when if you're in public service is with bad news. Or when someone needs something. Or when somebody needs something. And there's no loyalty. There's absolutely zero. You can work with somebody for 20 years, and there you're blah, 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 blah. And as soon as you're out of office, you're dead. Same thing with a pastor. Their phone never rings with good news. The last person they want to talk to is, you know, like an elder or a deacon or somebody in the church. Uh, their lives aren't perfect. They're messy. Their, their wives have cancer. Their kids might be screwed up on drugs. Uh, the, the suicide rate is, is enormous. Um, and they are all part of this cabal of the same divisions we have. Do they speak on COVID? Do they speak on the election? Do they not? Duh, duh, Black Lives Matter, Donald Trump, all these things are supposed, they just wanted to be in ministry and now they have to be political. And so they, I, I step back for a second and I go, these might be the most important leaders in culture that nobody pays any attention to. I mean, we have groups for, you know, send kids to camp and, and casting for a cure and wounded warriors and first responders and all the, da, 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 and I, those are all great, but nobody's actually trying to take care of these people as leaders and certainly not serve them. But usually, and, 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 and ministries are the same, they're going to serve them with an agenda. The agenda might be good, but it, there's an agenda. So we started this thing called Pastors Monday, where we take fly fishing, where we take pastors fly fishing, the very best experience. Um, I can't say that enough. Um, guided trip, um, best equipment, catered dinner, and there's no agenda. And it's confidential. And... Um, that's it. And uh, so we start doing this. One pastor turned into two, turned, turned into four. Last year we did 200. That's amazing. We just opened our second chapter two months ago in North Texas. We're probably going to open a third one this year. And the agenda is just to serve. And the natural, uh, the natural friendships and relationships that happen on the river uh, between these pastors, cross-denomination, cross-politics, uh, cross race, cross urban, cross rural. I mean, all the things that I want to do in politics, I'm watching happening on the river every year or every Monday. We go every Monday. And um, you just watch forest fires burn down, pastors work together, families have houses. Uh, kids get screwed up in drugs. Who does he talk to? He's sitting next to a pastor whose kid got screwed up in drugs 10 years before. Hey, I'm going to help you through all this. Cancer. COVID, all of the things that would you think a leader might need a day off from. They don't um, get a day off. There, there's this interesting, there's this interesting uh, verse in James that says, confess to one another that you'd be healed, which is interesting because it doesn't say confess that you'd be saved. It doesn't say talk to Jesus and everything will be all right. It says confess to each other. Well, how do you confess to each other if you don't trust anybody because you're one comment away from the biggest donor in your church leaving? You're one right. comment away from dividing your church. You're one co your phone's going to ring and someone's going to complain that the music was too loud or they didn't like your sermon. So we take these guys out there, mostly guys. But we also take women pastors, of course. But um, they get on the river. They have this experience. They've never done it before. They think it's a lot of fun, which it is. We mix them up. Somebody becomes friends with each other, and over time, as that friendship develops, they'll trust each other, and as they trust each other, they go to James 5, and, the, and we watch them get healed. And I wish I could tell both of you I was so smart. I saw all this in advance. <laughs> I'm not. I just, we stumbled into this fantastic underserved population of arguably the most important leaders in our country that nobody pays attention to because after all they're pastors they're supposed to have it all together they don't have it all together they're human beings you know right the, the, we're all centers and so uh we, we, it's just turned off and it's, it's just been uh terrific and and we you know every monday 
The ripple I, effect and, on the river. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and a quick side note here is I asked Jason, like, hey, I'd really like to come. He's like, we'll have you on when we start uh, Sinner Tuesday. Sinner so Tuesday. So I was like, right. That's, yeah. that's your money. <laughs> Sinner Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. Sinner Tuesday. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay. Serve the saints yeah. first, and then yeah. follow with the sinners. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, but I have a feeling I'm going to be the crazy first one <laughs> on Tuesday. Oh. You know, I oh, mean. It's, yeah. it's hysterical, and we've got a so on on uh, right now between the Oregon chapter and the North Texas chapter, we we FaceTime, you know. So when we're going on in Oregon, they're coming off in Texas, and so we FaceTime each other. And the pastors there have they they're like we're, we're the pastors in Oregon are like some crazy exotic animal. They're like, wow, we, we, <laughs> didn't, we didn't we didn't Wait, know you what guys do you were mean? Out there. All the, t- yeah. the, te- the well, Texas pastors are like in you know, Texas. There's 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 Christians in Texas, right? And not yeah. that many in Oregon. There's there's actually you know more adopted dogs in Oregon than, right. than Christians. I mean right. that's just the way it is. Where we is are that a, is that an independent. True I know that was it was it was in Washington right. State, but I don't know about Oregon. Mm-hmm. Just I mean, sorry, you did just you just kinda, call me out. I did. I was that's like, wait a second. I mean, I don't well, know, I'm a dog you know. guy. <laughs> but maybe. But anyway, so the the oh. Texans think the, the the Oregon people are all exotic and and uh, and we think the fish they catch are weird. But whatever, it's, it, it's not. It, the, what we've learned on Pastor Monday is uh, yes. We, we do these amazing things for take people and we teach them. 95% have never touched a fly rod. We teach them how to do all that. Pastor Monday has got very little to do with fishing. Right. So it's interesting. Interesting. What a great way to cross many, many bridges. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. It's fun. It's the, when you put the urban and rural together, when you put the young and old together, when you put the black and white together, um, it's it is it, it's you put the different denominations together. Yeah, I mean, it, it, in reality, it's my own personal reality show. So yeah. I just can't. It's tell actually anybody. fabulous. I mean, yeah. and you're Absolutely. following you on uh, TikTok is even. I'm not. I got, you guys and gotta Instagram. Help me. I'm better on the gram. Yeah. You are definitely <laughs> great on the gram. You're getting better on TikTok. I mean, there's. I saw that latest uh, little golf video you just did yeah. there. I think that is going to be. You think that'd be a TikTok uh, for sure? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, a little tick, ticky talk for you. Um, most so of the most of the pastors who have come, uh, their spouse have seen us on Instagram. Of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Your Instagram is pretty good. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's, it's it's coming. Yeah, for sure. And the show is fabulous. Um, so one other thing that I don't think Savannah, you know, so Jason is a man of of many friends in in, in connections. I'll never forget. I get. What was it? I, about a year ago, maybe maybe a little longer. He called me. He's like, "Hey, I got a, I got a guy for you to meet, and we got to do a call at this time." And, and I'm like, "Where are we calling?" And he's like, "Baghdad," and you said it like it was Medford. You're like Baghdad, <laughs> like Iraq. And you're like, yeah, Iraq. And I, I think that's fabulous. The connections he has. I mean, that's what you need to start another I'm just, no. thing about. It's called, we're going to start another show called Jason's Connections no. <laughs> because they are impressive. I'm, well, I, I, I'm not a name dropper. I'm just a simple country boy. It's the first time I've ever been on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> not a name yeah. dropper. That's, all right, fair enough. Will you be coy? No, I, I, mean, look, you know. I right now, I, I, I love public service. That's my first, that's what I thought I was going to do with my life. Now but you I'm, did do that well, for I, a very yeah, long time. I, I, I did. Um, my, uh, I don't even recognize the Republicans anymore. And I, in fact, I don't think too many people do. I, I don't think that um, people who call themselves conservatives really are. I, I think that word has changed a lot in the last four or five years, too. It means it means something entirely different than if you go back to I French philosophy. I don't recognize either party i gotta be but honest i mean that you know it's murky yeah, it's I mean, very very yeah, murky our 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 democrats are certainly not the same democrats mm-hmm. you get in other states and and okay so um but yeah the the other things we're doing in business is, are fun and uh this pastor monday thing has been it just to, to take care of those people as leaders has been an interesting shift in how you and how i look at serving them if I if I, I think I think if I thought of them as pastors, I would treat them a little bit different. I you know right uh, to for treat sure. them as leaders. Yeah, um, we have we have a rule that's interesting. Um, there's a very few rules except the ones I make, and uh, <laughs> one is is that you call a pastor by their title. 
Um, it's something I learned from politics. Um, when you put the word H O N honorable on somebody's uh, letterhead and they are now the honorable <coughs> Stephen Hodges, mm-hmm. um, I don't, I don't it kind of, it kind of <laughs> swells up a little bit. It kind of feels good to have the title. I could never understand how house members would have a big ego. They can't don't do it. <laughs> That's what senators say. Right. <laughs> but, um, in pastors, you meet a pastor and you go, oh, I have Pastor Stephen Hodges with me today. And he'll get, call me Stephen. Call me Steve. Just don't call me Pastor. And the reason they don't want to be called Pastor on their day off is if they've been so beat up that it's no longer an honorable thing. Now, pastors of a different color or race, I should say, they're very proud to be called Pastor all the time, even on Monday. But the white pastor doesn't want to be called Pastor. So we, I institute a rule that we'll call them by their title, even if they're uncomfortable, they'll have to get over, they get over it pretty fast, but as a term of returning respect back to that kind of service and honor back to that type of leadership, we don't have that same connection to public servants in Oregon today. They're all bad. All politicians are bad. If they have experience, we don't want them. We want to get rid of them, throw them all out. Let's have a, uh, you know, the swamp mentality thing in, in Washington, DC. And what you have is you have people who don't like public service, trying to take apart the institution they got elected to who don't know where the bathrooms are in the Capitol. The thing we found on this other thing that we've been doing is you return respect you return respect, you return respect, you build leaders. And it all starts back at respect. That's what human beings want. Mm-hmm. Are you, are you going <laughs> to call me, you know, my title? You huh? know, What's your t- what know, title? I don't know. Do you want? I'm going to make one up now. I want a title. Do you have a title? I, I do not title. have a title. No. I mean, can, can you make up a title? I'll give you one. Nope. Mm-mm. No, this is <laughs> you. Yeah, it's been a good show. Uh, let's wrap this up oh, right okay. now. Uh, oh, I'll give you a. Title. Oh, I'm getting a title. <laughs> That's great. Well, no, I think I think your listeners should be encouraged. Uh, at least on the governor's race in Oregon, you, you uh, our system of government um, is frustrating. It's slow. It's painful. Um, and the vote really does reflect the people. So sometimes the people will elect people who are complete fools. And sometimes they'll elect people who are real states people. Um, that's, you know, that's part of democracy. But uh, I love democracy, something that my party doesn't say very often. I love our system of government. And in the state of Oregon, with all of our flaws and all of our challenges, it worked again. The three best uh, candidates who are qualified to be governor on day one won their primaries. And so it's exciting. It's it's, Oregon's going to be okay. You know what I I, speaking kind of along those lines, a little quick, quick story. I was years and years ago, I was at a Blazer game and uh, I was yelling at one of the visiting players. And I was really, I mean, he couldn't hear me. And um, the gentleman, there was a gentleman right next to me, and a little bit older, you know, and, and I'm cheering, and he's cheering for the other team. And, you know, the guy I'm yelling at, and I, I kind of look at him like, that's weird. They kind of look a little bit alike, and <laughs> I'm yelling more, and this guy, he's not saying anything to me. And so I, I look over, and he said, hey, you know, uh, you're, you're a big, yeah, it was a Denver Nuggets, and he goes, yeah, you're yelling at my son. Man, <laughs> that big. And he goes, and because he goes, he's a human too. Oh. And, you know, here I, and at that moment, it was, you know, you could disagree with somebody politically, especially if they're a politician, they're human, right? And, and what I hear mostly from people that, you know, you, know, you find it, it's like, oh, I just talked to so-and-so, and they'll say, oh, God, they're the worst human being possible. And you're like, really? Because they were fabulous. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were really nice. I Oh, do you, you know, you know them? They're like, well, no, but they like this, this, you know, my camp, my camp, echo chamber, echo chamber. And I can't help but think like, at what point did we lose? They're a human, right? First and foremost, you know, when, you know, what happened to this? All right. You know, I don't agree with you politically, but I don't hate you right now. It's like, we're going to build hate. And, and some have said that, you know, that was the era of, Trump, I've heard that. 
I, I've heard others say it was the era, you know, the, the Obama election. Um, and I didn't get the memo on, you know, why, why I'm supposed to hate somebody by, by party lines or because somebody says to me that they're into, you know, a healthy climate that they're the enemy. Right. I, I don't see, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I don't understand where it all came. I don't really care where it came from, to be honest. I think it's weird. And I, I think that the fact that, you know, for us as Oregonians to feel like we're going to have a great election, potentially, we have to have three parties. I think that's ridiculous. I, I mean, you know, you, you get the best of what you can get. And these people are going to try all three of them, by the way, you know, and they're human. And I, I think that's where we, we lose sight as um, people of people are human. I, I know I was there when you lost your election. And I, I was telling my wife um, last night or the night before, I said, I'll never run for politics. No, number one, I'm not, I mean, I don't think I'd win anything, you know. Uh, but number two, more importantly, I see what it does to a human being. And to take in that much negativity that, people take in from the opposition and then to get kicked in the teeth and to watch what it does to another person. I think it's the worst thing I've ever seen. I've opened up a business. I've actually opened up two. I've been through what I call the trench or, you know, getting the grenades thrown at me. I've never, and I never will have any ambition to actually deal with what politicians deal with. And I, to a small degree, and I'll get off, my soapbox here, I guess, but kind of understand why they stay in the echo chamber, right? Because that's where it's safe. They, they're, we're, we're pitting them there, right? There's not one per, nobody's going to run for political office that says, I'm going to check all the boxes, right? I mean, I was hearing from people from the, uh, um, on social media from the Patriot, I don't know, it's not even a party. It's part of the, the farther right. And they're like, you can't vote for Drazen because she's a rhino. I'm going to vote for uh, Betsy Johnson. And I'm laughing because do you know what you just said, right? It's like they both are fairly moderate, right? I mean, in, in, my, in, in my opinion. And, and so I, I don't think we understand you know, that nothing's perfect. We all have different wants, goals, hopes, right? And we're not going to get perfect. But if we can get, if we can allow them to be leaders, they will be leaders. But if we're just going to tear people down, then we're going to end up in a very bad spot in this country. Historically, that's happened before. And that's kind of, you know, when I look at that night, so, you know, for every watching, listening, I just kind of forgot there was a mic in front of me and just went off. But um, it's been a day, <laughs> and I, I'm going to go coach some baseball here in a little bit, too. Um, but back to you, yeah. what you said, we have the three best candidates. The people voted. This is what we've got. We've got three strong women who are uh, entrenched in the system. They understand the agencies, the policies, so they're not going in cold. So you're saying there's hope. Yeah, there's always you, you gotta have hope. Well, because yeah. a lot of people right now Die in Portland hope. and Oregon, yeah, they don't feel like there's they hope. They don't feel like there's hope. They're, but I, I think, yeah, I mean, they is. don't feel like there's I hope. I know, but right. they're not on the podcast. I'm on the podcast. <laughs> you're on the <laughs> podcast, <laughs> and I'm no longer in office, so I don't have to reflect Correct. people. I'm just Correct. telling you what I think, and I think, uh, look, I think, uh, you know, Stephen, your comments. Um, I don't know when it started. Um, you know, it's you, you always look back that it was better. It was better then, and right. the legislature was better in the eighties. In the eighties, they said it was better in the seventies. And, and the future is always going to be, you know, terrible. You always, you know, there, there's always that element. <laughs> politics, uh, politics is a relational business. Yeah. And if you don't have relationships, you can stand up there and get endorsed by every talk radio. You can get on Fox News. You can say completely crazy things thinking and get, get elected, and then that person gets elected and completely has no relationships, has no ability to lead. Politics is a relational business, and I may be against you today, but I might need you tomorrow. One of the things Oregon did that is so foolish is we inst instituted all these ethics laws. And we're going to catch those evil politicians. I mean, even uh, Anderson Cooper used to have this 
stupid catchphrase, keeping them honest. I remember that. The, yeah. the, the thing about keeping them honest was the assumption that all politicians are dishonest. That's what, right. that's what Anderson Cooper was saying. Trust me, I'm Anderson Cooper. I'm going to keep them all honest because they're all dishonest. Well, the fact of the matter is, is they're not all dishonest. And we instituted all these stupid ethics laws that prevent Republicans from actually having dinner with Democrats. I don't know if you know that. But no, that, I did the, not that's, know that. There's absolutely no well, Somebody social, should get that off the books. There's no social element I think, between. I think it was Tobias Reed that told me that. The, the parties yeah. no longer can. Well, that's horrible. They no longer can talk. So, yeah, I can demonize you because I don't know anything about you and your kids and your right. struggle and where you came from. And, oh, you had to work three jobs to get through undergrad? Oh, you're just an evil Republican. You're just another one. You know, and it goes on and on and on and on right. and on. Um, look, I, uh, I used to serve with uh, John Kitzhopper, and I've rarely voted with him. In fact, I used to love to kill his bills just for sport, you know. <laughs> um, turns out he's a great friend of mine, and he and I had this fas- fascinating conversation one time about when he was in the, the Senate before he was governor. He, uh, and, and uh, later he was response. He had to make a choice between one kid dying or 200,000 women getting prenatal care. And the kid that had this particular disease more than likely, even with, with aid was going to die. I had a, a kid work. I ran a bill one time for this kid and, and, uh, nobody wanted to, to pass it that would allow this 16 year old kid to drive under these conditions about this medical condition and nobody Republicans and Democrats all wanted to kill my bill. When kids Hopper faced the thing, the legislature shut down and, and left him all by himself to make the decision. And he chose 200,000 women prenatal care. Mm. I shut the entire government down for three and a half days to get my bill passed because I knew I had relationships on both sides of the aisle and I knew how the levers of government work. And I stopped the entire legislature until every, I forced everybody to pass this bill for this one kid. So the question we, he and I debated was who was right? Shutting down government to save one or doing, letting one go for 200,000. And the fact is, we're both right, and right. we're both totally wrong. Mm-hmm. That's government. That's leadership. And you, you, th- that's, that nuance cannot be sold in the blogosphere, and it can't be sold on talk radio or on Fox News or MSNBC or any of these crazy wings because those people are never going to be in leadership to actually make the tough call. I'm going to make government run like a business. Boy, we used to hear that all the time. Well, that's great. Government doesn't run like a business. It runs like a government. It's a giant committee where nobody trusts everybody. And the reason why we don't trust everybody is because when we set up this country, we didn't want a king. So we made sure nobody could be king, so nobody have enough power. And now one party is asking for a king. It's ridiculous. So anyway, I'm still full of hope, though. Hope! Yeah, hope. Not, right. not crazy. <laughs> But well, when, on that note, <laughs> that's, a whole, that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> right. I'm going to go help coach a little league team. What's uh, the name of the team? We are the, well, uh, the Pickles. You're you the know. Pickles? Yeah. You're, so you're the pickles. coach of the Pickles? I'm not the head coach. Uh, no, yeah, I, mean, I just passed a background. Dill check, Sweet? So. What are nice. they? No, good the for pickles. you. Yeah, the no, my, pickles? My, my kiddo. So I help out. And yeah. uh-huh. uh, we've got, uh, I think, a few players out. I think we're having a. a some kind of, I don't know. And you wanted That's a awesome. title. I, I don't have a title, but I, yeah, I'm going to get a pickle title, I think. Supreme Allied save? Commander. Get a Commander. hat, at least right. a hat. I think, I think <laughs> the pickles. You can save that for the next podcast. Right. I think we should do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jason, thank you so I much. Hope, I hope it's I hope it's fun to be on um, with you, and uh, it's fun to be on with you. Um, <laughs> you, uh, well, but you know what? Know. If somebody, if, if we had a lighter topic, uh, we could actually do what we do on the phone anyway. I think right. it'd be a great morning show. I, I, well, I mean, I really do. I mean, well, I, I don't know what's holding us back. All this ph- philosophy stuff is like great, but not very entertaining. We have the lights. <laughs> you know, right, we, we do. do it. We do have the lights, we have the coax, we have the Wi-Fi. Let's do it. Let's make dreams come true. Let's make All dreams right. come true. I'm in. Savannah's <laughs> like, uh, I'm not Savannah's in. Savannah's like, yeah. she's, I'm out. Uh, I gotta go. I'm gonna go <laughs> hey, hey, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. All right. Thank you. 
thank you as always for checking out DMG's Bootstraps and Business. If you'd like to find out more about our guests, DMG, or these podcasts, just check out the show notes. Thank you.